All right, Connell, thank you. Mr. Secretary, thanks for joining Fox Business. Good to see you, Peter. Uh, is there a risk that the United States could lose its AAA credit rating, yes or no? No risk of that. No risk. No risk. Again, if you look, if you listen carefully now, you see the leadership of the United States of America, the president, the Republican leadership in both houses, and the Democrats recognizing now that this is the right thing to do for the economy, that we have to put in place now reforms that bring down our long-term deficits in ways that will help strengthen future growth. And that's in incredibly important recognition by people, and we'd like to put something in place as soon as we can so we can be begin that process. So Standard & Poor's is wrong. The United States will keep its AAA credit rating. You know, people, absolutely. And pe people who look at the United States, I mean, it's understandable, Peter. People out, you know, who run businesses across the country, investors around the world, they look at Washington. Washington's a hard place to read. And it's hard for people to look past the political rhetoric and try to understand whether the leadership of Washington is going to take the tough steps necessary to get ahead of this problem. But again, if you listen carefully now, it's enormously important what's happened just over the last few weeks. You had a bipartisan fiscal commission set out a broad target for deficit reduction. You see the President of the United States emba embrace that basic framework. Even House Republicans, after a long period of saying deficits don't matter, that tax cuts pay for themselves, that we could live within our means indefinitely, that growth will take care of everything, are saying that we have to bring our deficits down. They have roughly the same target, $4 trillion over 10 to 12 years. So if you listen carefully now, I think the prospects for a bipartisan agreement are better than they've been in a long period of time. Of course, we have to turn that into action. Yes, I mean, there, there seems to be a great deal of difference on the details on how to get to that point. It, it's uh, not just details. You know, there's, yeah. there's big differences and on... And the rhetoric is very sharp on is, both sides. Is there an yeah. environment for good faith negotiations? Uh, again, I think there is. Not, you know, I spent a lot of time talking to Republicans on the Hill, and I think both sides recognize to do this, it has to be bipartisan. And our challenge is to find ways to lock in what we agree on, knowing we're not going to agree on everything. And we have uh, very different visions about what the right growth strategy for the country is going forward and how to be fair to our commitments to the elderly and to the poor and the disabled. But even within those disagreements, the most important thing is you see both sides now saying that the right thing for the economy now is to lock in some reforms that achieve concrete savings, targets for savings for deficit reduction with a way to enforce those limits so that Congress is living within its means. So a deal on the debt ceiling will include some spending cuts, as the President acknowledged the other day, and then a reform package or some kind of mechanism what, uh, to, to, to get on a, some kind of path towards deficit reduction. What does that look like? Well, does it have enforcement yeah, mechanisms well, uh, or what? Well, that's the right question, Peter. P Congress is going to pass a debt limit. They recognize they have to do that. And the leadership have made it clear that they're going to do that. They're not going to play around with that. Because, again, you don't want to call into question the basic creditworthiness of the United States of America. It's about trust and confidence. It's a basic fundamental commitment. It's, almost, it's a moral commitment you can think of. And we're not going to call that into question. But the hard thing and the important thing to do is to bring people together and try to put in place some targets for deficit reduction, targets for savings, a time frame for achieving those, and an enforcement mechanism to make sure they happen. You know, it has to be a credible enforcement mechanism so the targets are meaningful. And if we can do that, I think that would provide a very positive signal. And that would justify the confidence you see around the world in the United States today that this government is going to get ahead of this problem, not fall behind it. By how much does the administration want Congress to raise the debt ceiling this time around? That's a judgment Congress has to make. You know, it's just about how often they want to vote for this. Remember, we're the only country in the world that does this. The debt limit that's authorized is just to give us the chance to borrow to finance commitments Congress has already made over in past Congresses in past decades. So there's no reason that Congress won't raise it. They always raise it. They have to decide how often they want to raise it. And there's no reason why them, they have to put their members through the torture of having to do it. <laughs> Frequently. <laughs> well, the last time Congress uh, raised the debt ceiling, when the Democrats were in control, it was by $1.9 trillion. Uh, is, is that the ballpark? Would, would that be a prudent increase that the, that the administration would, if it, if it would were, welcome? If it were up to me, yes. knowing that you want the world to know that our commitment to meet our obligations will never be in question, you would do it for as long as possible. Important to recognize that even under Paul Ryan's budget plan, you'd have to raise the debt limit by probably $2 trillion over the next 18 months to get through this, roughly the same amount as in the President's framework. So Congress has to do it, and Congress will do it. The hard thing for us to do is, again, is to find a way to take what we agree on, 
broad magnitude, broad scope of cuts we're going to need and put those in place so we can begin the process of living within our means again. All right, you gave me an opening there. It sounds like you would support an increase in the debt ceiling. The administration would support an increase in the debt ceiling of about two trillion dollars no, 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 this that, time around. Uh, Peter, really, the tradition on this is yeah. that Congress has to decide. Well, they have to decide. You don't, and want, it's just you, a, you don't want Congress to. Do you want Congress to go and and, and do you know debt increases uh, every month of a hundred billion here or three hundred billion be, or four hundred billion that here would be and have a, this fight every three months? That would be a ridiculous way to run the country. I can't imagine they decide that's a good thing to do to their members. Can't imagine that be the case. What Congress needs to do, and this is the right thing for the economy, is to make sure they pass a debt limit in a timely manner, don't take us too far into June to do that, and come together and put in place some reforms that will bring our deficits down over time. Because again, that's the necessary thing to do for the economy. I want to get back to the rhetoric question, though. It just, the rhetoric just sounds very tough on, on both sides. Uh, Paul Ryan came back from the President's speech last week and called the President's speech uh, demagoguery and partisan. Uh, the president is out, you know, throwing punches himself. I mean, how can you reassure uh, the public and investors that all of this rhetoric is not going to have an impact, that everybody's coming together behind the scenes? Is that, is that what's happening? People are going to see what we do. They're going to look beyond what we say, ultimately, and they'll look at what we actually are able to do together. That's the important test. Again, if we can do that, I think that would be a very strong signal to the rest of the world that the United States of America will do the right thing, will do what's necessary, as we always do. And we have a great tradition of rising to these challenges and doing them. And you can't do that today without doing it in a bipartisan basis. Now, I talk to Republicans on the Hill a lot. I've done so a lot over the last few days, not just the past few months. And again, I think they want to take advantage of this moment to put something in place. Everybody wants to vote for deficit reduction. Everybody wants to vote for fiscal responsibility. So we'd like to take advantage of that moment, this moment, and put something in place to be good for the economy. Now, we're going to disagree fundamentally, Peter, on a lot of things about what's the right growth strategy for the country, but I think we all agree that future growth requires that we begin to put reforms in place that will help make sure we're living within our means. We have to do it gradually, balanced way, preserve the capacity to invest in education, innovation. Those things are fundamentally important. And I think we have a chance to do that now. All right. Mr. Secretary, thanks for joining Fox Business. Good to see you. Stuart, 